afraid to give it a try. Good. Good. Look, there's no point in mincing words. I don't want you and Tori on the field at the same time. Why not? Let's put it this way. I don't think you can handle it. Anything to say? I work out with everybody else or I don't work out at all. Mariel Hemingway arguing with her Olympic track coach there, Scott Glenn, in Personal Best, one of four new movies we'll be reviewing this week on Sneak Previews. Across the offer me, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. Across the offer me is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. Along with Personal Best, we'll also be reviewing Jack Nicholson's new film, The Border, and a kidnap and poisonous snake thriller named Venom. Now Gene starts with the offbeat musical Zoot Suit. Zoot Suit is a film of a play about a chapter in the history of Mexican-Americans in this country, the World War II years in Los Angeles, when there was so-called Zoot Suit riots, street fights between young sailors and Mexican-American teenagers who wore outlandish, gangster-like clothes as a means of standing apart from both Mexican and American society, neither of which was making them feel welcome or comfortable. One of the major points of the play is to show us how an immigrant group can get caught in the trap of wanting to be different because the dominant culture won't accept them. But of course, one of the reasons the dominant culture won't accept them is because they're different. It's <laughs> quite a trap. The film employs a narrator guide who is almost always there commenting on the action. And here, in Mexican zoot suiter slang, he talks about the style of the play and what the zoot suit means. Ladies and gentlemen, the mono you're about to see is a construct of fact and fantasy. But relax, weigh the facts, and enjoy the pretense. Our pachuco realities will only make sense if you grasp their stylization. It was the secret fantasy of every vato, living in or out of the pachucada, to put on the zoo suit and play the myth. <laughs> Which you feel real root Look like a diamond Buckle and shining Ready for dancing Ready for the boogie tonight All the heck and the column With that brave shape Of all the pots of gold down in L.A. But we can sing the pop of gold Look real clean On the dance floor The world on the side on the way We'll hear it just tonight And put on a zoot suit Eventually, the story settles on one young zoot suitor, Henry Reyna, who wants to break out of the zoot suit image by joining the U.S. Navy. But the night before he scheduled the ship out, he and his brother put on their zoot suits for one last fling, which angers their very traditional father. The muchacho is finally doing something right. Uh, I should know. She, uh, uh, when I was in the Mexican Revolution, I, I was only... Yes, of course, we'll get the revolution because we'll be here all night. You laughing at me, Cito. You worry about getting yourself a job. You're still eating here for free. All right then. Keep your pinch of beans. Rodolfo! You see? You see how he is? How long before he ends up in jail, too? The Lupe will be waiting outside of him. Mm -hmm. Henry. Come in here. Yeah, huh? Where's my tequila? Porque, what are you going to do? The battle, mujer! 
and two glasses. Hmm. No, Swifty. Just like the saying goes. From such a stick, such a splinter. Que tal palo, tal a sillota. Oh. You're thinking not my compadre's daughter, eh? That'd be pretty. And very young, too. Innocent. Tu sabes? Mira, pa, I'm not gonna do anything. Ah, pero que va, hombre. I know I can trust you. I'm glad you're leaving all this pachuco mierda behind you. I'm proud you're in the Navy. Just do me one favor, eh? You know that switchblade in your pocket? Yeah, Pa. Rip apart that damn silly suit. <laughs> what happens next is that Henry gets into a fight, is mistakenly arrested for murder, and he is convicted in a ridiculous racist trial. This is a well-meaning film that does make its point. But the form of the film is extremely unsatisfactory. It turns into a herky-jerky exercise with moments of drama, followed by timeout for scenes of colorful dances. Then we're back with that narrator <laughs> constantly popping in and out of the action. So the film repeatedly interrupts its own dramatic mood. Filming a play is always a very tricky business, and Zoot Suit is not the first such play to fail as a movie. But fail it does even though it has such a strong statement to make about our society. It's sort of a shame. I think you put your finger right on it when you talk about it as a film play. Mm -hmm. The play, as it was produced on the stage in Los Angeles and briefly on Broadway, had characters who were trying to communicate to the audience about their own reality. The movie has actors who are not playing those characters, but who are playing actors. In other words, right. this is the record of a performance rather yes. than the record of a story. And, and what happens is movies demand a little bit more reality. Uh -huh. They should have made it as a period film, have those characters play their lives out, and we would have gotten involved. There's too much theatricality Every here. time the narrator comes on, we keep being reminded, oh, yeah, that's right, this is just a movie, this is just a story. Yeah. It's not really these people's lives. Or, it's... hey, there, a metaphor just walked in. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to miss any of the symbolism. Right. right. Let's look now at a thriller called Venom, a British production that tries to buy prestige with distinguished names, but it ends up being just a ridiculous catalog of one improbable situation after another. We can't get scared during this movie because we're too busy trying to keep track of everything. See if you can follow this. Venom is about a little boy who goes to a pet store to pick up a harmless house snake, but he's mistakenly given a box containing the deadly black mamba, the most poisonous snake in the world. Well, he brings it home where he's promptly pounced on by terrorists who want to kidnap him, and then things really get complicated because the snake escapes from its box, kills the kid's nurse. I'll tell everything. I'm just going to tell the first 19 minutes, okay? He, the, the snake kills the kid's nurse. Then he escapes into the ventilation system of the house. Meanwhile, the kidnappers shoot a policeman. The house is surrounded. In this scene, the kid has a potentially fatal asthma attack right after the kidnappers have taken a woman snake expert as hostage. Does it ever occur to you that this boy dies, you'll have nothing? Just do the best you can. Look, just let me go upstairs and get the boy's medicine. Let's go. Fancy, I fancy a drink. How about you? Why not? Yeah. Yes, it'll help us relax. Right? What would you like? We've got whiskey, brandy, gin. I think we've got most things. Oh, uh, I think I'll have a whiskey. Coming up. What is it? Come back. Come on. That snake is kind of a landbound jaws. It jumps out of something at somebody about every 12 minutes all the way through the film. Venom has the most distinguished cast in an undistinguished movie in a long time. Let's check off some of those familiar faces. <laughs> The kidnappers are Klaus Kinski and Oliver Reed. The snake expert is Sarah Miles. The child's grandfather is Hollywood veteran Sterling Hayden. And right outside the windows of that house is Nickel Williamson. He's waiting out there. He's the great stage actor who plays the commander from Scotland Yard. Well, that's a lot of talent stuck in a ridiculous and complicated plot. 
The cops are issuing ultimatums from the outside. The snake is crawling through the ventilation duct. <laughs> Kidnappers are fighting among themselves and chopping off people's fingers. The kid's choking for Beth breath, and we're wondering if Venom isn't the birth of a new genre. This could be the thriller as soap opera. Well, it doesn't work. Well, I like the genre, and I you like do? the film. I okay. did. All the stuff that you're talking about uh -huh. I, made me smile. Mm -hmm. This is a film that obviously knows exactly what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Having two things going on at once, the police and the kidnappers, that's the standard story. Who'd pay to see that? They throw the snake in the house, uh -huh. and suddenly the whole thing takes so off. So they're caught between a rock and a hard place. No, right? uh, between a snake and a policeman. Okay. Uh, the point is, uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. I got scared by the snakes. Snakes scare me in real life. It scared me in the film. I thought it was funny. I thought the performers, all these talented people, I thought they gave off sort of that thing we talked about before, the joy of performance. I they knew they were I, in a silly movie. I don't worked. think I got the joy of performance from them. It seemed to me that they were really going through the motions, that the dialogue was, did not sparkle, was not meant to be Some funny. Some of the things that Nicole Williams has, has as a policeman are very funny. I can't think of a single one that he says that I think is at all funny. It seems to me that they're really just kind of marching through this and that it's a machine. It's wound up. Here's the snake. Here's the cops. Let's make it go. And for I can hours. tell you that when the snake crawls up uh, Oliver Reed's leg, the whole audience levitated, to use I'm your sorry, phrase. I'm they sure they got thing. very excited. I thought it was a funny little well, minor was... thriller, but funny. Very, very minor. Not too funny. We it disagree. We disagree. Okay. Jack Nicholson is what is special about our next film, The Border, a fairly routine crime drama set on the Texas-Mexico line. Nicholson plays a Border Patrol officer who isn't willing to go along with his corrupt fellow officers who extort money from Mexican laborers who want to cross the border in order to work in the United States. And the corrupt cops are also into selling Mexican babies for black market adoptions. Nicholson refuses, saying that he pretty much wants to be left alone, to do a good job. And that's why we find him grabbing one of the baby sellers and demanding that the seller take him to the home where a baby is being held ready for sale. Who'd you sell the baby to? I can take you to him. We haven't sold him yet. He's okay. The baby's okay. I was waiting for a good home for him. Charlie. Rich people pay 25 grand for a baby like that. You and me, we could cut a deal. Sort of a nice moment there with tough Jack Nicholson yeah. caring for a little kid. <laughs> and that is what recommends the border. Nicholson's performance as Charlie Smith, a decent guy, just trying, as he says in the film, to do a good job. This character, not the movie, this character is equal to some of Nicholson's best work in such films as Five Easy Pieces and The Last Detail. He excels at playing guys who are in turmoil with their anger always under the surface, waiting to bust out in a full-scale rage. So I recommend The Border mainly for the fine performance by Jack Nicholson. I recommend it for the same reason, the mm. fine performance by Jack Nicholson. What don't you like? I wonder what if I don't thing. like. I don't like the fact that the Harvey Keitel character, the guy who lives next door, is not the as well guy. sketched out, the corrupt border patrolman. Not as, it's just sketched. It's not as well drawn as it could have been, given what a good actor Keitel is. Mm -hmm. I also object to the fact that the Mexicans are simply these noble icons. They go down to the river and do their laundry and stand mm -hmm. around in front of a sunset looking noble and persecuted. They are not given the dignity of being allowed to be characters of their own and to develop 
more into co-equals with uh, Nicholson and the other characters in terms of the story. All right, here's one more I don't like, and we're starting to dump on this film, but I don't like the ending, which I'm not going to give away, but I'm just okay. going to say it's so sweet. Uh -huh. that this film, which I do like because it's gritty and in some moments seems very real, mm -hmm. sound effects in particular, and Nicholson's character seems mm -hmm. like this grubby guy with a sweat-stained uniform and all this stuff, mm -hmm. they wind it up with a real cornball ending, in my yeah. opinion. But Nicholson is riveting, and that's why I would, I wouldn't, I'm a big Nicholson fan, uh -huh. and I wouldn't want to miss this movie for Well, don't you work. think this is a better movie than Venom? Yes. Thank you. Our next film, Personal Best, is about two women athletes in training for the 1980 Moscow Olympics, the games the United States boycotted. The two women meet, they compete for the same event, and they fall in love. You might naturally assume, therefore, that the movie is about homosexuality, and so it is. But I think its primary subject is competition. The two women's competition with other athletes, their competition with each other in the pentathlon event, and their fierce personal competitiveness as champion athletes. Competition is what eventually destroys their love relationship. The movie stars Mariel Hemingway, who was Woody Allen's teenage girlfriend in Manhattan, and Patricia Donnelly, a former Olympics marathoner. And in this scene, near the breakup of their relationship, they're facing the possibility that they cannot continue to be both competitors and lovers. I'm at the women's gym, then who's going to spot you? Tingloff. Tingloff? Wait a second. Tingloff? Yeah, Tingloff. Oh, isn't that nice? Hi, guys. Sure, I just, just don't understand why you get so angry. I think you do. Oh, God, can we just go work out? Do whatever you want. That's just it, I can't. I can't stop worrying about you. What about me? What you're thinking, what you think I think, what you want, everything. I don't... So, you worry about what everybody thinks. Why should you be different with me? Hi. Come on, you guys. Either you move out or I move out, and we really are just friends. No. No? Oh, hell. Don't worry, we won't work out together. No, that's not it. I want to work out. You make me feel like I can do something, like I'm going to do something more than Tingloff. I just... What? Need you. Both performances are interesting there. Mariel Hemingway is a kind of lovable, shallow, inarticulate child. And Patricia Donnelly is a woman who's been hurt too often. Donnelly is an American Olympic athlete. This is her first performance as an actress. It's surprisingly mm -hmm. good. What's being hinted at there is the possibility that Donnelly, the older athlete, is jealous both because Hemingway may have found herself a boyfriend and because Hemingway, her protege, may turn out to be a better athlete. Their shaky relationship also bothers the coach of the uh, women's Olympic team, played by Scott Glenn. And here he tells Hemingway how he sees things. Starting next year, I want you to do pentathlon. What's wrong? I don't think I can do that. Mm. Well, if you can't, you can't. You got speed, strength of body weight that's unreal. I misjudged it all. You know, Chris, there's room for more than one in the country. One what? Pentathlete. If Tori goes to the games, that leaves room for two more. I wasn't thinking about that. Of course you weren't. I wasn't. I'm agreeing with you. You really think you know it all, don't you? No. No, like one thing I don't know. I don't know what scares you more. Getting beat by Tori Skinner or beating her. So Hemingway decides to go for the pentathlon, but she's still uptight about competing with her friend who she sees in the cafeteria. You go. 
say, 1335 or better, you've got an edge. No, it'll be uphill all the way. Look at me. I said, look at me. Let go of my arm. You're not going to say a word to her. The day you run my race, you run my life. Can I get my turn? Look around you. Look at everybody. Now imagine how many bodies you all buried to get here. The games, the javelin, the discus, the shot, their weapons. Don't kid yourself. You're here to kill anybody that gets in your way and all the rest is bull. Get up from this table now. You're on your own. Muriel Hemingway is just great in this movie at playing a kid, a person whose face reflects all of her emotions and whose heart is really, she's wearing it on her sleeve. One of the best things about Personal Best is that the movie is a knowing and thoughtful exploration of many of the issues of sports at the Olympic level. It quietly accepts the homosexuality of its two main characters without making a big deal out of it, and it goes on to explore several other subjects, including the rigors of Olympic training, the problem of trust in a romance between competitors, the pressures to win, or sometimes the pressures to lose, and the emotional development of the younger girl who still has a lot to learn about life. She's a lot better at running the 800 meters than she is at mapping out her own feelings. Now, Personal Best is a film that approaches sexuality and sports with the frankness of the locker room. There's complete nudity in this movie. It's an adult picture, and I have a feeling it's going to be controversial, but I think it distinguishes itself with an absolute openness and honesty, and I recommend it. So do I. I think it's an absolutely wonderful film. And I want to give this sort of a strange praise by saying, I like this picture because I didn't know what it was about until it was almost mm -hmm. at the end, when there comes across a, a, a statement, I think quite a beautiful one, about competition, and that all that you can really compete with is yourself, mm -hmm. that the real measure is uh, making your best effort that day, and hopefully it's better than the previous day. But before that, this film is a mystery. And by that I mean, we see this relationship, it comes on us as a surprise. I didn't expect the two women to get involved with each other. Then the film unfolds, and I was just following it like life. Like I, a story. Like a real story. This is the kind of movie, I think we've had discussions like this on sneak previews before, the kind of movie that we look for, where two particular people are closely observed for the length of a film, yes. in terms of who they are, how they behave, how they talk, how they relate to each other. It is not as if the director, Robert Town, said, I'm going to make a movie about two homosexual women. Right, no. He said, I'm going to make a movie about two athletes. They're women. They fall in love with each other. As if that is part of the development of the film rather than some kind of a box office concept. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Robert Town. This is his first film as a director. Uh -huh. He's written some of the greatest screenplays of recent years, Shampoo, Chinatown. The writing is beautiful. Mm -hmm. I guess as a writer, he comes up with these interesting lifelike characters, mm -hmm. and that's why this film works. It's a remarkable effort for a first-time director. Here he is, Sparky the Wonder Dog, jumping into the balcony, back again with the Dogs of the Week, the week's worst movie. Well, my dog this week is Vice Squad, a scuzzy crime film that opens with the announcement that it was made with, quote, the cooperation of law enforcement authorities. <laughs> wow, that probably means they got a permit to film on Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> vice Squad turns out to be an extremely cruel and boring story about one vice cop's attempt to nail the biggest pimp in Hollywood, a pseudo-big Texan named Ramrod, very subtle, <laughs> right, by using a, pe a prostitute as bait. The film contains a lot of crude sexual scenes, prostitutes being hit by wire coat hangers, and yet, despite all the sensationalism, Vice Squad is strangely boring. It takes such a long time before we ever get to that inevitable shootout between the cop and Ramrod. I saw people actually sleeping during this film's chase scenes. Kind of wonder if those people might not have slept through anything. Though, Maybe. Right? My Dog This Week is a really rare discovery, a kung fu movie called Jaws of the Dragon, in which none of the actors is really very good at kung fu. <laughs> You know those movies Roy's complaining about where the whole movie consists of nothing but kung fu experts mm -hmm. leaping around and chopping each other? Well, this movie has kung fu experts who stand around and threaten to chop <laughs> each other. Jaws of the Dragon is about two <laughs> gangs of heroin dealers, five guys in each gang. They ride around in black limousines with briefcases full of heroin and jump out from behind trees at each other. <laughs> and you remember that cinematic device I used to call the semi-obligatory lyrical interlude? Well, that's when... All the action stops dead while the hero and his girlfriend drift around in slow motion while silhouetted against sunsets and the soundtrack plays a ripoff of the Marlboro theme. Well, <laughs> once the semi-obligatory lyrical interlude starts in this movie, it just doesn't know when to stop. Very strange film. Now let's take another look at the main movies on this show. Roger and I agree that Zoot Suit was too visually distracting to work as a movie. The message gets lost 
in all the music and that narrator. Two no votes for that one. We disagree on Venom. Roger felt the plot was too confusing. I felt it was entertaining, so a split vote. Two yes votes, though, for The Border, Jack Nicholson's performance that saves a routine crime drama. We both recommend the film for his performance. And finally, two yes votes for Personal Best, starring Mariel Hemingway, a beautifully written film that sees athletic competition as competition with oneself. So on this show, I'd say the one we agree on the most Personal strongly best. is Personal Best, the real let's put it this way, an adult film. We yeah. you know, some people are going to be very shocked by it. Except I think that what keeps you going on this picture is that it just seems on the mark. There don't mm -hmm. seem to be too many false statements. In and the they're film. not looking for sensationalism in terms of the sexual content. No. It's not an exploitation film. Straightforward. And we recommend The Border for Nicholson. And I want to stick up for Venom. Okay. Just because The Border is better, as I answered your question earlier, <laughs> that doesn't mean that Venom's bad. Well, it doesn't mean Venom's bad, according to you. Okay, right. Hey, that's all for this week. <laughs> Join us next time. We'll take a look at more new movies, including Cannery Row, the John Steinbeck epic starring Nick Nolte, Night Crossing, a new daring adventure escape from Disney, and Making Love, a contemporary love story starring Kate Jackson. And until then, we'll see you at the movies. Funding for sneak previews was provided by this station and by other public television stations.